Meet the Farmer TV is made possible by the generous support of Planet Earth Diversified, Makia Video Productions, and Melly Productions, with additional support from the Blue Light Grill and Raw Bar, working closely with local farms. And Flavor Magazine, serving the Piedmont's local food and wine culture. Previously on Meet the Farmer TV, we visited Sublime All Natural Juice Bar, where they use local produce, wheat grass, and specially blended custom teas from Dawn Story of New Moon Naturals. Today, she'll take us to her mushroom supplier, Mark Jones, at Sharondale Farm in Sismont, Virginia. He'll show us how he grows mushrooms, his permaculture experiments, a couple of grants he's been working on, and even bioremediation using mushrooms. So Dawn, here we are drinking some of your prototype teas. So we're guinea pigs now, right? That's right. So if I start growing horns or, you know, a you tail can thank or me something. Later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so tell me about tell me about these uh, these three okay. prototype teas that we're we're testing here. Okay, well, well one of these is more of a heart tonic and reishi has many properties. So what I did is I, I'm sort of playing off um, some of the many properties of the reishi mushroom. So this uh -huh. one is more of a, a heart blend. So it has rose petals and rose hips, hawthorn, hawthorn berry, leaf and flower, uh, lemon balm and lemongrass for a little uh, good flavor there. And it's all about the heart, calming the heart shin. And then we have, let's see, this one is the immune tonic. Um, this one has antivirals and antibiotic herbs, um, uh, some immune tonics, and um, this one is more of a zen tea. This one is very calming um, to the spirit and includes herbs like uh, catnip and kava kava and such. Wow. Now, all of these are using mushrooms that you got right here at Sharon Darrell Farms. That's correct. Well, let's bring Mark in and have him tell us about these mushrooms. Okay. Hello. Hello, Mike. Good to meet you, Mark. Good to see you. And tell you. us Welcome. about Sharondale Farm. We're here, we're, we're here in uh, Sismont, Virginia. And how did you get here and how did you start growing mushrooms? Well, this has been uh, my family homestead for uh, five generations now. My wow. great-great-grandfather built this house uh, after the Civil War and I have the good fortune to be here now. Um, so, I've been so how many hundreds of years is this? Oh, now? about 140 some years. 140 years mm -hmm. in this this piece of land has been uh, in, 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 in your my family. family. Correct. Wow. Yeah. Uh -huh. Have they always grown mushrooms since the Civil War? Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, I I, uh, I I was in. I became interested in that after college and uh, pursued the wild mushrooms for a long time, and then uh, got into permaculture and and urban perennial uh, agriculture. And uh, so after I moved from the city, I moved out here and decided mushrooms would be a good project to incorporate into perennial agriculture and perennial gardening. And that's where that's where I am now. Mostly outdoor experimentation, but I plan to to uh, do some more indoor work and, and grow mushrooms indoors as well. Wow. Tell us a little bit about what's special about them, how you grow them, how you know you got interested in them, and whether it's your favorite or you know anything like sure. that. Sure. Well, these are all dried mushrooms, and I dry these to, to store them long term. Um, everybody's familiar with shiitake. These are grown on oak logs, and we'll see that in a little while outside. Um, the garden giant here is uh, is grown on on wood waste, primarily wood chips on the ground. Um, the lion's mane is a native mushroom here, and that's grown on oak logs as well. And I also grow that on sawdust indoors. The maitake grows on oak. This is a this is a wild specimen that I found in the uh, side yard on a, on a white oak, and I've cloned that, and we'll experiment with that on on some oak logs. This is chicken of the woods. Uh, I found that up in uh, the Blue Ridge Mountains, and I cloned that, and have some experiments going on with that. And this is reishi. This is uh, the, the Chinese ling chi mushroom, a medicinal mushroom that I grow on oak logs. Now, do you have a lab where you're doing, when you said you cloned this, the, the ones that you found? I have a clean found? room, yeah. Um, and, uh, and basically, it just uh, it has a high efficiency HEPA filter, yeah, which, yeah. which cleans the air up and uh, allows me to do um, culture work so I can have single, single strains in each culture. Wow. And I can... Uh, I can develop spawn from that. The spawn is, uh, is the mycelium of the mushroom, the, the root system, the, the main body of it. And I grow that into grain or sawdust, and then I can inoculate bulk substrates with that. Wow. So. Now, we have, we have both a dry 
shiitake and a, a fresh one here, right? Yes. Now this one just harvested a few minutes ago. Right? Yeah, this morning. Mm -hmm. And then did you dry this yourself? I did. And how yeah. do you how do you dry these? And I mean, th is this the right ratio? This one turns into this. Uh, that's pretty close. This this one was probably closer to this okay. size here. Um, and the way I dry the mushrooms is uh, is first in the sunlight with the gills up. And and what they found recently is that uh, mushrooms are able to convert sunlight to vitamin D through sunlight, like we can with our skin. Even when they're disconnected? Even when they're disconnected. This, so, so uh, this, this chemical this... process occurs with, with UV light. So they're dried in the sunlight for a while, about six hours, and then I, I use a regular uh, food dehydrator uh -huh. uh, to, to finish the job and get them down to uh, moisture content that's, that, that will allow them to be stored long term. And what's, what sort of um, weight ratio? Like what does this weigh wet and then what does it weigh dry? Oh, How yeah, much mushrooms about 90% water. And I would say these are dried down to about 10%. So, so if I buy a pound of dried mushrooms from you, it started out as 10 pounds of fresh harvest. Uh, more or less, yeah. That's more pretty amazing. So there's, there should be a huge price difference in these things. There is pound. a price difference, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Now, can we see your... your Clean room. Can we see the HEPA filter? Can you show some of that? Sure, I'd be glad to show you. Okay. So, so this is this a, a personal investment you're making as you're expanding, and so, you know, as a small grower, you're putting all this money into a special building to grow more of these, just hoping that you're going to sell enough mushrooms to pay for all That's of that. That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So we had the shiitakes. Let's do now. This is the reishi again. Now, tell me what's special about this. Uh, this is uh. This variety grows wild along with some other uh, species. That, there's one on hemlock that grows, uh, that's a native, and they all have uh, medicinal value. Their, their beta-glucans are, are what are important medicinally, and they, uh, they uh, are immunopotentiators. That means they support the immune system. Um, uh -huh. They're good for skin and uh, basically general health, a health tonic. Wow. Um, now, where do most of these come from? Are most of them grown locally or wildcrafted or are they um, brought in from China or where, where does it? I'm not sure where this strain comes from. It's a, it's a commercial strain that I purchased and, re and, and, and made spawn and inoculated the logs. Uh -huh. And uh, after about 15 months, they started to fruit this last summer. So uh, hopefully over the next several years, they will <clears throat> they will continue to fruit. There are growers around in the United States that uh, that, that dedicate houses just to growing mushrooms like this and medicinal mushrooms. And then there, there are one or two uh, companies that uh, create medicinal tinctures that they're are very hard, aren't they? They are. They're, they're very hard woody. So they're yeah. not, they're not edible, but they are, they are medicinal. So do you need to dry these as well? I did, I did dry those and okay. I, I dried those in the sun and then um, basically put them in a refrigerator in a, in a paper bag and they dried the rest of the way. Now, when Dawn makes her teas out of these, how does she, do, do you process them for her? Does she get these whole and, and then grind them and for well, her I teas? gave her to these whole, and then uh, she had some difficulty breaking them up, but I took, uh, I took my garden shears and cut them into smaller pieces, and then you were able to, to use the Vita, Vitamax, yes. Vita, Vitamixer. Vitamixer. Yeah, uh, right. to, uh, to further So we're doing them. some UL life testing on some grinders, I guess. It sounds that way, yeah. <laughs> I haven't seen that process yet. <laughs> right. That's, that's tremendous. So you're actually cultivating these and, and putting the spawn in uh, dead, like you would do a shiitake, where you take a drill a hole and Correct. put the spawn in and a plug. Right. You have to water them and and keep uh, when them it's moist. when it's dry in the summer, I'll irrigate it a little bit. But uh, and it's mm -hmm. like eighteen months from that inoculation. Yeah, it was get... about fifteen months from the inoculation till okay. when they fruited. It was a, a good year and a few months. Now you mentioned something specifically about hemlock. Is hemlock a a particularly good substrate to grow them on? Or? This is a different species than the one that grows on hemlock. Okay. Um, but you can wildcraft as much of the hemlock uh, species as, as you like in our mountains here. Well, so. there's been a, a recent outbreak in the last couple of years of the woolly agelid that's killing all the hemlocks. Correct. Uh, and w one of the places uh, that we'll visit in, in a future episode is in Floyd County, and there are these dying hemlocks. Mm -hmm. So is that something a farmer could do is, is uh, bring these hemlock logs to you or somehow try to capture this loss of, 
of the hemlock trees and turn them into a, a special reishi well, uh, substrate. Just, or, right. Um, just out in the wild on the dying, the dead and dying hemlocks, you'll find these mushrooms. So if you are in a place where you can collect private land, or mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you need a, a permit up in the uh, in the national forest, uh -huh. right? um, but uh, it's it's very. Now they common. grow right along the side, like shelf mushrooms. Yeah, they or are on shelf the mushrooms. Yes, okay. they primarily grow on uh, out of the wood. Mm -hmm. We've also seen in in areas next to those hemlocks, uh, tulip poplar trees and and morels coming up, really kind of from the root stock around around that. But these would be growing like shelf mushrooms off the side of the Correct. trees. Correct. They'd be on the wood. Yeah. That's great. So really, could you inoculate a dead tree? Uh, it's probably best to inoculate what would be a live dormant tree. Cutting down live dormant tree or, or taking uh, storm damaged trees. Um, Deadwood usually has other species already starting to break it down, so you have a lot more competition in that wood for the, the nutrient nutrients. Um, and to establish a mushroom like this in a piece of wood that's already uh, degrading with other species is, is difficult. So you've got a competition. You got competition. So right? when you're doing this inside, do you like sterilize that sawdust or do something to yes. kill that competition and yes. then put in what you want? Correct. Good. So maybe you can show us some of that too. Sure. Yeah. Like most people are familiar with shiitake. These mushrooms are all dried. Um, this is a dried shiitake mushroom. This is a chicken of the woods that I wildcrafted in the mountains. Um, I found about 30 pounds of that on my birthday a year ago or so. Wow. This is the garden giant that I grow on wood chips, um, and that springs up every year once it's inoculated to your garden. Uh, this is the lion's mane, um, and I grow this on sawdust as well as uh, oak logs. This is a maitake or hen of the woods. It's a polypore that I found out uh, on an oak tree uh, in the yard. and. Uh, this is reishi, the Chinese ling chi mushroom. It's also a polypore and, and uh, a medicinal mushroom. Mushrooms don't photosynthesize, they're heterotrophs. They need external uh, nutrient. Right. That's why you find them on dead wood and on the ground or okay. in association with living organisms. So the concept of them being live, like we think of a basil plant, is really very different. Yes, they need, a, they, they need external nutrients, whereas a basil plant creates its own uh, So they're not energy. making sugar from, from photons. Correct. They're actually consuming, uh, uh, what, cellulose or? Yeah, they, they, break down, uh, they break down large molecules. Um, and when, when they live on de dead organisms, they, they break down large organisms like cellulose and hemicellulose and lignin. And uh, for this reason, they're, they're excellent at breaking down other large uh, complex uh, carbon molecules, and so there, some of these are used in uh, bioremediation and cleanup of, uh, of toxic wastes and, wow. and lots of research. In so is there an right oil now. spill mushroom that will clean yeah. up oil spills? There is, actually. Uh, Paul Stamets out west has uh, done a bunch of research with that, uh, um, with Battelle Laboratories, as well as uh, I think there's, a, there's some current research on the oil spill in the Bay Area uh -huh. um, where they're using... Uh, maybe hair mats or something like that with wow. uh, different mushrooms to see if they can absorb surface oil spills on water. Well, that's interesting. So. Do you have any other uh, hot new things about bioremediation using uh, fungi instead of uh, uh, giant chemical plants or scrubbers? Uh, well, uh, one of the current research uh, uh, avenues is with poultry manure. And mm. uh, in, in many of the southeastern states anyway, they're there are millions, hundreds of millions of chickens produced and at least that much manure in terms of pounds. Uh -huh. And uh, to remediate this to protect watersheds is, is a, a problem. Uh -huh. And so there are some people in Alabama that are working uh, with different mushroom strains to, to remediate the antibiotics as well as uh, the, the other um, coliform bacteria and so forth in the manure. Uh, um, in, in windrows, in large, large piles. Wow. Nice. I've been growing uh, food since uh, the uh, late 80s and early 90s when I was in uh, graduate school at LSU and uh, was studying plant pathology. Wow. Um, that, uh, I, I killed more plants than I grew in that, <laughs> uh, but, uh, <laughs> but I, I, I gained an interest for the ecology and agriculture and uh, 
and and decided uh, growing uh, growing food is uh, was is important and I wanted to pursue that. So when I moved to uh, moved to the West Coast and, and lived in the big city, I decided uh, urban agriculture was the way to go and and more or less people growing food at home. I've been encouraging people to do that for a long time to, to grow food rather than planting a rhododendron, put a blueberry plant in. Uh-huh. I mean, this is the shortest distance that your food should travel sometimes. Right. So, um, <clears throat> and then uh, I developed a uh, a perennial fruit and fiber and flower garden at, at, at my house in, in Portland uh, and filled up my yard. And uh, I was back just uh, this last year and it's really productive and pretty exciting to see that, see that uh, taking off. The fellow that, that it lives there now is really kind of taking care of it and, and uh, expanding. So it's a legacy it. that's continuing on. I hope so. Yeah, it was kind of in a in an, a fringe part of the city, and most people have lawns that aren't too well kept. And and uh, I I was standing in the backyard one day, and I realized there were birds and insects buzzing everywhere. And I looked down my neighbor's yards this way and that way, and it looked like dead airspace. But over my yard was this great buzzing and and uh, living organism in my in my yard, basically, and and. That really inspired me to pursue it uh, in, in more detail and think about uh, the basis for, um, for growing ecological gardens. And uh, again, mushrooms are that basis. So we can use them not only for food and medicine, but for soil building, for cleanup of toxins and, uh, and many other things that they, they do that we most of the time are unaware of. So you went from, from LSU as a, a grad student killing and analyzing plants to Oregon and growing plants where uh, plants hadn't been grown and you were basically you know, populating a, a, an urban dead zone. Uh, and now you're here in Virginia at Sharondale Farm and you're, you're spawning mushrooms in, a, in a, a clean room and getting ready to build a, a big facility just to produce mushrooms. And you're working with Dawn's story of New Moon Naturals creating special teas for medicinal healing effects. Right. Uh, teas and, and a couple other product lines in the works for, uh, for value-added mushroom uh, sales. How about you show us uh, how you do some spawning? Uh, and, and I know that we've got to do some sanitization, and we probably can't go in there, but we'll try to, uh, to take a, a look at you through a, a viewing window. And tell us some about uh, how we've got to, to, to protect your uh, clean area and then show us some of the, uh, the growing on uh, sawdust or chips or grain that you do in a, in a sanitized media that you then inoculate. And then we want to see this, this new facility that you're getting ready to build and, and some of the, the logs where the shiitakes are growing right now. Sure. Okay, Mark, so here we are in this specially constructed clean room. I've taken my shoes off, but you've let me in with my super clean clothes here. But tell me what you do in this room. Uh, this is where I capture wild strains of mushrooms by using uh, antibiotic media on petri plates. And uh, I take a little bit of the tissue and put it on there, and the antibiotics, and the antibiotic in there <clears throat> suppresses bacterial growth and enhances the, the mycelial growth of the mushroom. Okay. And then I transfer that away to uh, a, a a different type of media that doesn't have antibiotics in it, and then I get uh, I get strains like this, and uh, they all look a little different. But uh, these are wow. these are a couple of different uh, species right here, and uh, from those I inoculate grain, primarily rye, sterilized rye grain, and okay. when it, when the mycelium grows out, it looks like this. So uh, <clears throat> what's going on in here is a uh, the, the mycelium expands on the grain, and then I take the grain and I inoculate sterilized sawdust, sometimes uh, just straight sawdust, but other times uh, uh, supplemented with some sort of uh, bran for nitrogen, okay. uh, nitrogen requirements for the species. Do things ever go wrong? Does like oh, wrong sure. stuff grow or it dies or well, I had it's a, too uh, hot or too cold? Or? I had a contamination outbreak in here earlier this year, and I had to shut it all down, remove everything, clean this up, and, uh, and then turn it back on and go back wow. to, to start over. 
So that's why I store the cultures in test tubes in the refrigerator so I can go back if I have a, a calamity like that, come back and, and restart things. And a lot of things for us to look at. Well, I don't grow any food in this room unless you like rye grain. Right. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, most of, the, most of this is, uh, is then inoculated into bulk substrates, straw or wood products or, or farm waste manures. And then uh, that's where the mushrooms grow. Okay. So, so you would you would find a mushroom that you're interested in, and like extract spores or uh, no, or primarily it? tissue. So, uh, so yeah. You look for healthy live tissue. Correct. Yes. Bring that here. Put it on a, a petri dish with an antibiotic media, so you're growing the the mycelium and not a bacteria. Correct. Mm -hmm. And then once you're happy with that move that into this media in the bag that might be a grain or a grain bran or a sawdust. That's right. And you have to sanitize all of this stuff? This is all sterilized, yes. So all the grain and all like the sawdust. All the and I, have a, I have a few stereoclaves that are right outside this door so I can okay. I can cook outside and then roll them in here and unload them oh. directly onto the table. Oh, I see we got a garage door here. Well, it's just a flip up door right here. Wow. And uh, you know, the, since the the room this this fan takes in outside air, so there's positive pressure. Okay. So there's always air blowing out of the cracks and so forth. So it doesn't suck air back in and, and contaminants back in. So it's a, a, a traditional positive pressure. Yeah, it's just room. a clean room. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Yeah. Do you do anything to sanitize the air, uh, ultraviolet or electrostatic? No, or anything other that's than not necessary. Just uh, to have a filter. Yeah. This is a uh, this is this is the uh, ninety nine point nine percent efficient down to. Point, point 0.1 microns. I'm not sure. I don't. And this remember. runs continuously. This is a continually, continuously running. And unless I change out the filters, I'll turn it off for 10 minutes. Uh -huh. Yeah. And then I use uh, I use iodine to sterilize uh, these solid surfaces. Um, beyond, I, I moved away from bleach because it's toxic. I don't I don't want to mess with it. Right. I wonder if people really realize that when they are buying a little package of mushrooms in the store, all of what went on here to make that happen. Uh, Probably most people don't know the full process. They just think yeah. you went out in the woods, found these things for free, and are charging them twenty bucks. Well, <laughs> <laughs> something like that. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's so. take a look at some more of your facility and, and look at where you're building a uh, you're building a special grow room or a grow building. That's correct. You call them stereoclaves or autoclaves? Yeah, autoclaves. they're they're uh, they're. What's the difference between an autoclave and a stereo? I'm not sure there's any difference. Okay. I think it's just the the, the verbiage. You know, All right. Semantics. Um, they look like giant pressure cookers. They are. They are just large pressure cookers. They run on 220. That makes them a little more efficient in terms of the power use. And uh, you know, I can fit uh, around 40 pounds of bulks of, of uh, grain or uh, or sawdust into each one of those. So. And how um, long does it take? What's the, how long does it uh, the take? grain cooks for approximately an hour, uh, hour and a half, and the sawdust takes about four hours. Wow. So, and those are that's uh, encapsulated in those bags that you saw earlier with the filter patch, so that there's uh, there can be air exchange as uh, as the mushroom metabolizes in there. Now, once you sterilize these things, you can't open them here. You, you no, put them I roll into your these. Room. I roll these into the into the lab. They're on this this roller here. Okay. And they'll just roll directly into the lab, and then they'll come back down to room room pressure, uh -huh. and then I can unload them. Directly onto the the, uh, the laminar flow table. Right. Well, that's great. All right. So let's let's see some stuff outside. Some sure. of the logs and and you built this whole clean room just for this. Let's see the uh, your plans for building a, a growing building. Okay, Mark. Here we are in the woods. This is your growing area, right? I see some beds. I see logs, pots, and uh, with logs in them. And a new building. So show us all of what's going on here. I'll show you some of what's going on here. And uh, there's not a whole lot right now in the winter time. Um, primarily, they're shiitake logs that you see standing up here. And you'll see a few mushrooms uh, over here that haven't been harvested. Um, oh, good. So th this on is, these logs. Is this where you got stuff this morning that we were yes. looking at? Yes. Yes. So basically, uh, shiitake shiitake is grown on oak logs. Uh, I use white oak and, and red oak and chestnut oak. I prefer uh, the white oak and, and the red oak uh, because they're, I, I'm sorry, the white oak and the chestnut oak because there's a lot of this kind of, uh, of disease pressure on, on the bark. That's a uh, competitive mushroom on the bark and what happens when this comes on is, 
it, uh, it kills the bark and blasts the bark off and then the log dries out and, uh, and it's all over. Now, so, do you sterilize these? No, these are cut uh, when the tree is alive and dormant. When okay. the tree is dormant, it has like the this sugars. This time of year, this December. time of year is perfect. Before, be, you know, after the leaves turn colors and before they the trees leaf out in the spring is a perfect time. Uh, what happens in the fall is that the trees take the the sugars from the leaves and store them in the wood, and that's what we're looking for is a higher sugar content in the wood, and that that helps the mushroom establish itself and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, gives it the, the nutrition it needs to get going. Wow. Now this is sort of different than what you do in the lab because there you're taking sawdust and, and autoclaving it and sterilizing it. Correct. Uh, and then that sawdust is used to inoculate the logs and holes are drilled in oh, about every six inches like this and then every couple inches around the diameter and the holes are plugged with the sawdust with the live organism in it and then cheese wax is put over the top and then it takes anywhere from six to 12 months to, uh, to realize a, a crop from shiitake logs anyway. Wow, and you've got them all uh, tagged and sterilized. Everyone is labeled. Yeah, I, in 2005, I, I inoculated a bunch of logs and did not label them, and I have no idea what's going on there now. <laughs> I know they produce mushrooms, but I don't, uh, I don't know w which they are. I have uh, about six different varieties of shiitake that I'm experimenting wow. with, see what works the best. And, I didn't know. I thought a shiitake was a shiitake. But uh, no, there are different varieties. And uh, I've found a couple that are wide range strains that perform in, in temperature ranges uh, broader than some of the others. And they're excellent. They work very well here in Virginia. Wow. Now, do you do you train people how to do this? Do you have workshops? Or if yeah, I, I offer workshops. Can, mm -hmm. can you provide spawn of some of these special varieties? I do. I, I sell spawn. and. Uh, uh, I would also sell cultures. I also uh, sell logs, and I, I offer workshops on how to do log uh, inoculation and cultivation, and also uh, garden bed cultivation and wood chips. Well, that's so. great. These are the, the remnants of uh, a, a SARE grant that I was awarded uh, this year to look at developing a, a, a mushroom as an outdoor crop and optimizing manure waste uh, management for small farms. And I have uh, poultry manure and cow manure that I inoculated with the almond portobello and trying to figure out a way to grow those out of doors uh, without sterilized substrate and, uh, and, and get a new crop for this part of, uh, part of Virginia. So we've learned a lot today from Mark Jones here at Sharondale Farm about mushrooms and permaculture and bioremediation using mushrooms. Thank you for joining us for another exciting episode of Meet the Farmer TV. For additional information and extended versions of this program, visit our website, www.meetthefarmer.com. Meet the Farmer TV was made possible by the generous support of Planet Earth Diversified, Makia Video Productions, and Melly Productions, with additional support from the Blue Light Grill and Raw Bar, working closely with local farms, and Flavor Magazine, serving the Piedmont's local food and wine culture.